Okay, welcome back everybody. Day two of our grand online experiment. Um, we are in the middle of covering vectors, which again is the uh, most mathematical part of our um, class. So <laughs> what I mean by that is right now we're sort of we're sort of stuck in the math. We, we haven't really applied anything, so a lot of stuff is going to seem abstract. And we're going to be like that for the rest of the day. Um, Brian, did you have a question? I see your microphone's on. Well, I can't hear you. Are you phoned in? Let me turn the volume up. No? Okay. Well, I, guess, I guess it's just phoned in, in there. All right, um, let me go to the back to the chat. I just don't see whose microphone is on one or the other. Okay, so let's keep let's just sort of keep on trucking through. So, if you remember, I want to recall your attention to some of the stuff we talked about yesterday. Right? We have our vectors here, a and b, and we have their x components, y components, and these unit vector quantities here. Now you remember that the unit vectors, all right, fulfill the criteria given in this part of the slide. Oh, no, I didn't mean to cross that out. That's okay. I can't always really see it. Okay, so they have magnitude of one, they have a peculiar direction, uh, and they lack both dimension and unit. That means that they don't have, there's not meters, they're not, they, they can apply to anything. Um, <coughs> And they're labeled with a hat. So to make to make this simpler and to give it context, how I was thinking about it, your vector can just exist, right? This vector can be arbitrary. It can have certainly a length when you define it and a and units itself. But the unit vector occurs. You can only create unit vectors when you assign an origin and a coordinate system. All right. So a lot of times uh, we, 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 we'll talk about being coordinate system independent. And in physics, it's important for our quantities, right? But, but basically what we do is we often pick a coordinate system so that we can perform analysis, right? The, the fundamental properties of the vector need to be independent of a coordinate system. But picking a coordinate system can make our lives make a problem very easy or it can make a problem very hard. And we're going to see that really explicitly when we talk about forces. So let's, let me cho choose a different color here and, and sort of show you what I mean. So if we go and we draw a nice little coordinate system here, again, you know, right? It's not, it's not pretty. But we can call this then A sub Y and A sub X. But this analysis only begins once we choose a coordinate system. <coughs> so the I hat and the J hat imbue vector properties based on a coordinate system choice for analysis. So I hope that makes some sense. I, I feel like that's something I could say over and over and over again, and it, it, and it would probably be useful each time. But, um, but OK. All right, so good? OK. Just chime in or, or text, say something in the text box if you have a question. Okay, so we saw here um, that vectors can be, um, if you look at what I'm circling here, that we can break vectors into components in all three dimensions. Hold on. All right, so if you look at the highlighted box, <coughs> that's not good. <coughs> Right, you can break a vector into x, y, and z components. And we covered how to do that yesterday. Um, you know, we covered the different representations going from component, uh, uh, a component representation to a magnitude representation. So let's take a look at that briefly. Let's go back in the slides. All right, I just want to remind you all that this happened, right? We saw that we have components on one side, an angle 
and magnitude on the other, and the same thing down here, right? We have angle components, or sorry, magnitude and components. We have angle and components. So these are two ways of representing the same thing, and you can um, you can represent them. Uh, you know, you can transform between each representation. One is easier to visualize and gain intuition with. Uh, I think that's the angle magnitude. And the other is easier to calculate and actually solve problems with. That's the components. So we'll see that just right now. We're going to start an example. So, <coughs> so let's go to our example. Basically, what the example is, is consider the following three vectors, right? These three vectors here. You have A, B, and C. So what I want you to do is I want you to take uh, two minutes. I'm going to go get a, uh, uh, a glass of water and take two minutes and add these vectors. And I want you to notice that only the I components add with the I components, just like we said yesterday, and only the J components will add with the J components. And I'll come back. I'm going to give you some time to work on that. And when I come back um, in about 90 seconds, uh, you will let me you let me know what you get, okay? So I have to practice the nice online etiquette and say that I'm I'm. Back. <coughs> okay. So, anyone uh, get anything? Okay. That seems reasonable. Two point six minus two point three. Good. All right. Let's see. Let's see if that's the way to do it. So by just looking at the I parts, we have four point two minus one point six. Um, let's three point two. So two point six sounds right to me. And then um, we have minus three point seven minus one point five. It's going to be four five point two. Minus 2.9. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me do that one. So that's so minus minus 1.5 minus 3.7. That's going to be minus 5.2 minus 2.9. Ah, uh, that's going to be or plus 2.9 rather. It's going to be. <coughs> So if it's three, then, then it's right. That's yeah. So minus three would be uh, two point three, right? No. Five point three minus three is two point three, and then there's another point nine here. So no, uh, we're getting we're getting a uh, we all like two point six. Hold on. I'll set it up as a real problem now. It's early in the morning. 5.3, right? No. Or is it 5.7? Hold on. I'm going to clear it out. There's some disagreement here. OK. So minus 1.5. <laughs> it's all right. It's the. Can't read my neither can I on this thing. It's a little frustrating. <laughs> um, 
So minus 1.5. It's just simple addition. It's no big deal, but it is. Um, minus 1.5 plus 2.3 is going to be, um, yeah, no unit, or meters. That's the unit that's meters that we're working with. So 2.3 minus 1.8, right? So 1.5, so that's 0.5, yeah, 0.8 equals positive 0.8, and then uh, 3.7, yeah, it's a little easier. Um, so that's going to be 2.9, yeah. So we're going to have 2.6 I minus 2.9 J. <coughs> I don't see that. We seem to be confused on J. I'm going to say, does someone want to, uh, it's, it's to the point at least that it's early enough in the morning that I'm, uh, I'll, I get a calculator. Isn't 2.3J? Well, let me take a look. Um, stumped by arithmetic. I never said I could do arithmetic. Um, <coughs> I often mess up the digits in my head, so I'll just do it this way. Um, so three, four, five point two. That's um, so it's going to be two point nine minus five point two. Yeah, hold on. <coughs> minus one point five. I'm getting two point three two plus 2.9, <coughs> hold on, let me, let me clear this for a minute, um, 1.5 plus 2.9 equals, okay, that's where I messed up. Yeah, it is 2.3. All right. I this is that stupid. <laughs> um, so <laughs> So yeah. Um so definitely 2. Point, uh so that makes this wrong too. So yeah, it's definitely uh 2.6 i minus 2.3 j uh, you'll notice I, I trust myself with the scales. I don't trust myself with the uh, the adding, particularly not first thing in the uh, in the afternoon. Um, so anyway, the point the point here is that we can add <coughs> we can add to the j column only, right? So we have three terms and the x column only. Now I want you to take some time and find the magnitude of this vector and the angle of this vector, all right? And we find the magnitude of a plus b plus c. We take the square root of 2.6 squared uh, plus 2.3 squared. <coughs> okay, that'll give us the magnitude and the angle we can find with tangent of theta equals minus. I did the, I got rid of the minus sign here because minus 2.3 times minus 2.3, it's it's all going to be, it's just going to be positive, right? Same thing as positive, symmetrical. doesn't matter. So that's why I didn't do that here. But here we have to keep that minus in. It's going to be 2.3 over 2.6. <laughs> so 40-something degrees. Yes, it, 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 Tala, it should be minus 2.3 squared, but ask yourself, can you tell the difference between 2.3 squared and minus 2.3 squared? There you go. <laughs> um, neither can I. So, <coughs> so that's why I left it in here easier. Uh, so 3.47 sounds good. And... Um, and then um, 
the tan, what's the angle? What are you getting for the angle? And we can sort of guess where the angle is based on the components because it will be positive x, but here, so you want to be sure your theta, because you might get multiple angles for theta, it should be in the fourth quadrant here. Okay, so you should, you should get an, an angle that's between negative or zero and negative 90 or greater than 270 but lower than 360. It depends on how you do your calculator. Uh, you'll notice we have different angles. So is anyone able to get the angle? I'm good with the magnitude. <laughs> Negative 41.5 sounds right. And what do I mean by sounds right? If these were the same number, the angle would be 45 degrees, right? We, we just, we should know, I mean, you should be aware of that. So 2.3 and 2.6 are close, and the minus sign, again, tells us, the minus sign tells us that we're going to be in this quadrant. <laughs> so negative 41.5, like I said, sounds right. Everyone else get, get something similar? Again, your calculator might put it in a positive spin and say something like um, 3, <laughs> let me say 270, like 311 or something like that. Should also be just fine. Okay, good. All right, now this skill that we're doing now, and I'm glad every, a lot of you seem to be able to do it, is you're going to be doing this constantly. So if you're struggling with it, or if I ask you to break something into components, um, or do, or, or seem like uh, I'm expecting you to know vector stuff and you're, you're getting confused, I, I mean way later down the line, not just today. <laughs> you want to come back to this chapter and review it and look at it because it's really, it's really foundational. It's really important. And like I said, it's important enough that we actually will teach you a little bit of math, which is this vector stuff. Uh, some of you who are in Calc 3 will have seen it already, but um, uh, what you do, at, oh, uh, find the angle. So first you find the, the magnitude, right? Then you find the angle. That's what I want you to do. Um, <clears throat> and to find the angle, you just take the arctangent, remember, it's the, uh, the y component, over the x component. <clears throat> so you really want to pay attention to this, this particular stuff. Now, I believe we're going to go on to the world of, uh, you, can, you can see a, uh, oh, yeah, Zilla. You can put your mic on if you want with the raised hand thing, or you can type. Oh, you got your type. So our 2.3, is, is it just what you typed here? Yeah, I just want to type. Okay. So our 2.6 and 3.6, the components of the A, B, and C vectors. No, they're the components of the A plus B plus C vector. All right? So uh, when we look here, we have, if you see this, this, um, this here, we have A, B, and C. And so what the first thing you have to do is, <coughs> well, no, bad. Hold on, bad thing. So the first thing, this is a good question. <coughs> so geometrically, here are the given three vectors, right? So you add these together. You can make, if you want to do it geometrically, I'll try and do this with lines here. Um, we can add these with a parallelogram. Make this, make this parallel. Hold on. It won't be perfect, but one second. Let me get this. So we have that, and then we can get, that would be A plus B. And then when we we'd add A plus B to C, right, we could do the same thing. Um, that's, so that's, hold on, that's the A plus B vector, right? And... That's the, that vector. And then we start to get something down in this quadrant like this. All right? So it's not great, 
but what I'm trying to, the question I'm trying to answer is, um, um, is that what we're looking at really is R. Hold on, let me clear this really quick. What we're really looking at is R. That's where the 2.6 uh, and the minus 2.3 come for. And you'll notice we have them right here, right? Those are the components, 2.6i minus 2.3, give us R. <laughs> All right, cursor, sorry. <laughs> we have them right here, the 2.6 and the minus 2.3, give us R. And here, we also just have the R vector. That's where our components are coming from, okay? <laughs> yeah, so Mina has it right. Uh, they are the components of the new vector resulting from the sum of A plus B. Um, <coughs> okay, good. Uh, Mina, are, I, I saw you put your hand up earlier. Are you just putting this part, saying the same thing? Looks like that's what you said on the text. Um. Hi, Professor. So I, read, I read my hand because of, uh, the, of the comment Zilia made about the cursor. We were not seeing the cursor only by the option lines you were drawing. That's all. Oh, okay. Uh, right. Yeah, no, I can only, unfortunately, I can only either draw or have the cursor up. So it's, uh, um, if I, I, I think, I think what we should do as a class, if, if, um, since I can't always hear, um, the, um, <coughs> the, uh, the text when I'm writing or if I get lost in the flow, if that happens next time, just tell me, uh, cursor. Just someone put on their mic really quick and just go, oh, cursor. And then I'll I'll hear it and I'll go do it. I think that that'll probably work. That sound good? Okay, good. <coughs> All right. So, um, so degrees or radians? That's a good question. Right now, degrees will seem more um, will seem more intuitive, and you'll probably want to use degrees. But you're going to need to get used to radians pretty quick because when you start really doing analysis, you're um, and really messing with things like waves and things like that, you degrees will stop making sense, and you you need to only use radians. Uh, like when we do harmonic motion at the end of the semester and evaluate other trig functions, we're only going to uh, use radians. So, so it's sort of a whole departure from degrees to radians. But that being said, you will. The, you know, the, you're going to be asked to answer questions in degrees. So, <laughs> but radians are are a little bit more mathematically uh, consistent. Okay, so let's go on to the wide world of vector multiplication. So vector, mul <laughs> vector multiplication, like I, I mentioned yesterday, <coughs> is a little funny. It's a little weird. Okay, so... We want to look at two uh, our two forms of vector multiplication. First is the dot product, okay, where we take two vectors and we get output with a scalar. Now you'll notice here that you have a dot b a dot b equals a b cosine phi. I want to talk about this cosine phi for a minute. All right. Now, generally, when you do components, this can be a little confusing. You draw a triangle, like I have up here, with some angle theta. Yeah. And this angle theta will tell you, you know, once you pick an origin, whether you have your x or y components. Now, what's important to note, and that we don't really, we didn't really see, uh, we are going to use the cross product. Yeah. Yeah, but we're just, we're just doing them one at a time. Um, <coughs> but what's hard to see here, or, or may not be uh, may, not, may not be easy to see, is that our x and y components, right, and our equations for them are dependent on how we set up this triangle. Okay, so for instance, when we start rotating coordinate systems, um, you know, when we start going from something like this, hold on. Let me draw it. Let me get the straight lines. When we go from something like this 
right, to something like this, and we rotate our axes, <coughs> we're gonna def we're gonna find that. Um, so this would be our standard right hand coordinate system. This is just a rotating coordinate system. We're going to be doing this very soon, um, very very soon. So. <laughs> So when you rotate your coordinate axes, you could rotate your angle, right? And what and all of a sudden your analysis for your AX and AY might look different. All right? You might get that in that X component, it's actually sine theta, and in the uh, Y component, it's cosine theta. And it's easier to show you when we have an actual problem set up. And we'll start doing that more in chapters five. Well, actually, we'll start doing that. Um, uh, but what's important to note is that this cosine phi is not based on this triangle. With the dot product, it's always cosine phi. So let's delete this and draw two vectors, arbitrary vectors. Um, da -da -da -da, clear. If we look here at two vectors, so I'll just draw them. Let's call that A and B. <laughs> That's uh, not great. So we have a, uh, we have vector a and vector b, right? If we have these two vectors, then uh, we can put the tail next to the other tail, and we'll always have some angle between them. So let's do that over here. We have a, basically, right, and b. You see what I mean by putting the tail next to the tail? So that's B. And A. And there's an angle between them. That's what phi is. Okay? It doesn't need to be part of a right triangle. It's not, <coughs> it's not a, uh, <coughs> a coordinate dependent analysis tool, which our components are. Our coordinates depend on our components. The angle between two vectors, the angle between two vectors does not depend on components. Okay, you'll notice I've not set up a coordinate system here. So uh, a dot b will the can be you can take the magnitude of a, the magnitude of b, and multiply it both by cosine of phi. So that's an easy way to do this. Now another way to do this is if you have a something in unit vector notation, you can notice here that all you have to do is distribute, and you will notice something interesting. So with unit vectors, we see here that, hold on, let's look at the dot product of unit vectors, i dot j and i dot i. Now the magnitude of <clears throat> the magnitude of i hat and the magnitude of j hat is 1. So we have 1 times 1 is 1, right? But then we have cosine phi in between them. So phi, what's the angle between these two? Does anyone know? Should I mean to write between i hat and j hat? This is, this is important. 90, good. And what's the cosine of 90? So i dot j, so 0 times 1 is 0, and i dot j is equal to 0. Okay? Now we want to stop and pause here. If only for, how did that all get? That's weird. Um, <coughs> I don't know why all that got selected, but we'll, we'll just go with, go with it. Um, but I want you to notice something, though. Why cosine psi isn't cosine? Oh, because, again, one, I want to be very clear, Alvin. There's no fundamental, theta and phi are not fundamentally different things. They're just renaming quantities. Why did we rename it phi here? Um, like I said before, theta, we usually associate with making components, which is coordinate dependent. Phi is not dependent on coordinates. Phi is just this arbitrary angle in between them. 
So we use phi to di differentiate between those two ideas because we just went over components with theta. And again, theta can change if we rotate coordinates and things like that. Whereas if we rotate our coordinate system, this phi doesn't change at all. And this phi isn't constructed by a triangle. It's part of the definition of the dot product. Okay, you can't take a, a sign of this phi angle and ever get a, a dot product. It never works. So they're different. That's why we're using phi instead of theta. I hope that makes some sense. Um, it's just to keep track of two things that behave differently. Um, so what I do want to point out here, though, is that I think for the first time, if you haven't seen this stuff, you're multiplying something that's not zero times something else that's not zero, and you get zero, which is a pretty big deal, right? With real numbers, if a, if a times b is equal to zero, either a or b must be zero. This is not true with vector multiplication. So this is one weird new thing. It is possible to take two non-zero uh, elements, multiply them together, and get zero. Okay? So that's spooky thing one. However, that makes this more convenient, right? Because <coughs> um, you have uh, all the terms that aren't, right, the i dot j and the i dot k terms, we already know those are going to go away. So we'll only have to consider the i dot i, j dot j, and k dot k terms uh, in our evaluation of the dot product in, um, in component form. And let's look really quick at i dot i. So i dot i is 1 times 1, and then the angle between i hat and i hat is 0 degrees, right? They're parallel. They're the same vector. So therefore, cosine of 0 is 1, and you get that i dot i is equal to 1. So the vector parts will all become equal to 1, so that's why they're not here because they're just uh, implicit. And then you can multiply the, the ax bx plus ay by plus az bz. And that gives you your uh, dot product. Okay? Does that make sense? Is it good? Wait for some. All right. Remember, we are recording too. So I always go back. And I don't know if that first recording showed up. So. I need to see if it's there. I don't know why my phone is becoming so, I can hear it in the other room. It's there? Good, wonderful. Okay. <coughs> so, let's, uh, let's go on. Um, so, let's, I'm just seeing if there's anything new here. Um, they use this language of projection. You'll see that in more advanced math classes. It's just a different way um, of using it, <coughs> of talking about vectors. Um, so da -da -da -da, where I guess they, they talk about one of these being a projection. Um, what the vectors are coplanar. So I think the vectors are always coplanar in a dot product. Um, you just define the plane of the vector, to be honest. You, uh, um, you're not, it's actually, you know, <clears throat> coplanar will be more important for cross product uh, where the object is actually a vector. But one of the things I want you to see is you can literally take any orientation of these vectors for the dot product, and it doesn't matter where they are. You just create the plane in which they're coplanar, and you have an angle between them. Uh, and then you can look at their map, right? I mean, so if you if you set up components, there's a way to analyze the dot product and get it, get an answer. That's what we were just looking at. But you you don't need it, right? You can just create any arbitrary plane for these vectors and say this is the x y axis for that plane. Uh, break it into components and do it. But if you just have the magnitude and the angle, you don't need coordinates at all. <laughs> Therefore, it doesn't you know it doesn't really matter. And you can just take your magnitude of A times your magnitude of B and multiply them by the cosine of theta. Um, even if you were to make this degree three-dimensional, they may not seem coplanar, but that's where the power of rotation comes in. You pick up your system, rotate it, give it a plane, 
and you do the analysis. The mathematicians not, might, might not like it, but you know. I found some good videos, or, or someone sent me a video. Uh, there's a series of a physicists and a mathematicians class, and mathematicians and a physicist class. I think you, you all might enjoy those. <laughs> you should check them out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's what I have to say about the co-planarness of the whole, the whole thing. Um, so let's see. All right. So a little star checkpoint here. If the angle phi between the two vectors is zero, the component of one vector along the other is maximum. And is, and so also is the dot product of the vectors. If it instead is 90, then obviously the component of one vector along the other is zero, and so is the dot product, okay? So let's do a checkpoint. We have vectors C and D. They have magnitudes of three units and four units respectively. Uh, what is the angle between uh, C and D if C dot D equals uh, zero, 12, and minus 12 units? Okay, so that's interesting. So let's, let's write this down a little. All right, so we have vectors C and D. So we know that stuff we know. We know the magnitude of C is 3. And it's just arbitrary units. We know the magnitude of D is equal to 4 units, right? And so C dot D, the trick here, is to just write this down, right? C dot D equals C D cosine phi, right? So if you need the analysis or wondering how the machinery works, this is the whole the whole trick to it. So I'll do the first one with you and see if you can get to B and C. So with A, they're saying that this whole thing equals zero, right? So we already know that three times four is 12. So the only way for the dot product to be zero is if phi is zero, right? So if, if C and D are, or not, I'm sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> it's phi if, uh, if phi is 90 degrees. So the only way uh, the dot product can be zero is if C is actually perpendicular to D, right? Because remember, vectors are magnitude and direction. Right now, we're, we're very much playing with, the, with changing the direction. And you can see that the direction can change the entire look of the problem. So C dot D is equal to zero if phi is equal to 90, all right? So, <laughs> so look and try B and C and see what you come up with. <clears throat> give you, I'll give you uh, a minute to do that. I'm going to go see what's going on with my phone. It keeps blinking. It's almost like they're telling me the school is, is, is turning down. Oh, I forgot. I'm, I, too, must practice the nice online etiquette. Hold on.
I'm back. All right, let me see. It looks like it looks like most of you got it. Both well, no, both B and C can't be zero degrees, right? But I think we're already there. All right, good. So let's take a look. Um, oh, I'm going to allow the camera to go. So yeah, I see. So some good discussion on here. Um, so remember, keep in mind that it's minus 12 for C and uh, 12 for B. And remember, <coughs> what we want to look at is the difference between C and D looking like this. That would be B, right? And the angle would be uh, 0. And then for part C, they would actually look like this. It would be anti-parallel. Right, and the uh, angle would be 180 degrees. Okay, so that's how that that's the visual. Oh, let me, yeah. That's the visual difference between this would be B, this would be C. Okay, so the negative. That's also an interesting thing here, right? We have two seemingly positive numbers or positive quantities, right? But the angle here will determine whether it's positive or negative. So, so some of our, our fundamental rules of multiplication don't really work with the dot product. And it's a, and it's a weird, it's a weird object because even though this is, it's straightforward how to do it. It's not, it's not terribly difficult to compute or to do, but abstractly, it's a very strange multiplication because again, you're inputting <coughs> vectors in n dimensions and getting a real number. That's weird. It just is. It's just weird. Um, and this, this situation works really well for uh, two-dimensional vectors, but if you have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine n-dimensional vectors, you can actually still do the dot product. You just have to do it in, um, in what you would call it, uh, component form. Uh, you'll need to know uh, some system in, because we can't really picture higher dimensions, you'll need some system in which to define things in higher dimensions. And then you can, you can map from that uh, abstract space to this, uh, again, you were appearing twice. I don't know how to fix that. I'm not tech savvy. So hopefully uh, that's one of those things that when it does work, the camera sort of fixes itself. So I'll try and make it. I'll try and shift it there. I don't. I don't really quite know why it does that. I think it's one. one of, it's, it's a weird property of my camera. Uh, sometimes I notice it does fix itself, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so we're we're just gonna. Can you see out the window there, though? That's nice. I guess you can see my filing cabinet. <laughs> um, so I don't think I have anything there that shouldn't be there. All right. <laughs> anyway. I guess you're getting the back window. You'll see. You might see some pigeons fly. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, uh, was there a question? I heard the dink dink and then it went away. Oh, good. All right. Oh, no problem. So, so yeah. So this checkpoint makes sense. And if we go, we'll see the answers. They will, I'm sure, agree with us, right? 90, 0, and 100. So we understand where these come from. Just what we looked at. Good. OK. <coughs> so <coughs> now the cross product, we're going to call it the vector product here. It'll be written like this, though. I hate. I hate how they do stuff like this. They think they're saving you from something. It's a bad habit of 90s. Uh, of the 90s, we need to stop the kids from being scared of what they're going to see. It's rubbish. A cross B. So we have the cross here, or, or a traditional multiplying symbol, because we're going to input a vector in our, in our space and get out another vector in that space. So we have a vector times a vector equals a vector. Now, this is more natural, but it's a little harder to do. Now, again, you might be saying, well, um, 
I need to turn off the, uh, that's what I was supposed to do. Um, you might need to, uh, you might look at yourself and say, well, wait a minute, this is just sine phi instead of C. It is, but it's a vector, so we also have to determine, so the magnitude can be this simple. It's often much more difficult. Um, but we have to have the direction, the direction has to be determined by the right-hand rule. And what you might notice is that if you're doing this component by component, is now only the stuff that's parallel, right? will cancel, and the things that are perpendicular are not going to cancel. If you, you may notice that here, oh, wait a minute, oops, sorry. You may notice that here with this sign term, all right? So what that means is that when you do it component by component, you're gonna have six things to think about with a three-dimensional vector. And you might be saying, oh, well, we could just do a two-dimensional vector, not gonna work here. Cross product is defined in R3. It, is, it, it, it takes three-dimensional vectors and gives back another three-dimensional vector. You can generalize the cross product, but that is beyond the scope. Most physicists will never use that. You need to be a do general relativity to really start using what they call wedge products. And you, uh, <coughs> you wouldn't even see that in a math class unless you start doing analysis, uh, you know, intro to real analysis. Um, so most of you will never see that. Um, um, the direction is determined by the right-hand rule, all right? So we're going to, you'll notice they have some of it here. Uh, we place the vectors tail to tail, sweep the finger from the first to the second, uh, and the thumb points in the direction. So let's do that over here on the side very quickly. Let's get two vectors. So here's two random vectors. We'll use our, we'll use our two random vectors again, A and B, all right? A and B. Now, don't get your screens dirty doing this or anything. But get your right hand, right, and put it on A on the screen, right here like so. All right. So you should you should put it, um, you, you know, professor, just to be on the same page. Multiplication of vectors produces the magnitude of the new. Hold on. No, 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 no. So, to, so a good question here. Uh, multiplication of vectors produces a scalar result, the magnitude of the new vector. No, 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 that is not the case at all. Um, the, multi, the dot product is the scalar product. So the dot product takes two vectors, uh, and I want to go, I want to even go back and, and look at it again. The dot product takes two vectors, okay, and gives you a scalar. The vector product, which is what we're talking about now, gives you a new vector. So, and the vector has magnitude, and we use our right-hand rule, which we're going over right now, to get the direction. So the vector product gives you a vector with a scalar and a direction, or a magnitude and a direction. Very important distinction. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, I'm going to go with, I'm going to assume it does. All right, so if we look at, I'm going to make this a little easier on myself. So if we look at this as A and this is B, <clears throat> if you put your hand on A on the screen here, and you, you line up, so if you lay your hand, oh, hold on. If you lay your hand flat on this vector, your right hand, you'll notice you can curl your hand up towards B and stick your thumb out. So that, that vector that comes out of the board will be, um, will be the, a, the C vector. So the cross product vector is perpendicular to both A and B, all right? And it will come out of the board. Note, the dot product does not produce a new vector, period. The, the, that's important to notice. Dot product produces a scalar, and that's it. There is no direction or anything. 
Uh, so, oh, I see you, you switched it. And the, okay. Um, and the new the cross vector produces a new vector. It has direction and energy. Yes, yes. But the dot product, um, well, vectors have magnitudes and directions. All right. So a magnitude of a number is just a number. You don't get any new information out of it. And there's no additional information to it. I mean, I guess that's one way to say it. Like, like, uh, uh, but a scalar has a magnitude, but that's it. It has no direction. So I don't think it makes sense to say only vectors have magnitude. But vectors have magnitude and direction. Scalars have just a magnitude. Okay. All right. I don't. I keep. I keep doing this thing where I talk to the chat box. That's why I'm not looking at you guys at the camera. I'm still getting used to it. So I'm trying not to do it because that's that's where I see you. <laughs> it's really. I realize you must be wondering why is he looking at the compute? Why is he looking off to the side? I'm, I'm not trying to see him, uh, uh, you know, deep or anything. Um, I'm just, it's, it's just a new thing. Um, good. That's probably for the best, Nicholas. <laughs> um, to be honest, uh, because my monitor is huge. I have a 43-inch monitor, uh, so. All right, <coughs> it, it creates challenges. <coughs> so back to back to the uh, nuts and bolts here. Um, uh, if A and B are parallel or anti-parallel, A cross B is zero. The magnitude of A cross B, which can be written as like this, you'll see this, is a maximum when A and B are perpendicular to each other. And again, I want to we'll look at the right-hand rule. Um, this is going to be really hard, so I'm going to I'm actually going to get. You know what I'm going to do? You might want to maximize the camera for a minute. Hold on. Let me. Um, I think I'm going to do this on paper because this will be easier uh, to do on paper. Because I'm just realizing doing it on the just because we're all online doesn't mean everything needs to be online. So. I mean, it will, it'll be on the line, but it doesn't involve like, digital and screen capture. So, so can you all see this? A, A and B, the two vectors. So what I do is I get my, if you can see it, I'm going to move it for there. So all you do to do the right hand rule is you get your hand, you lay it flat on A, and you curl your hands towards B, and you stick your thumb out, all right? And you'll notice that A, A cross B, right, this gives me a vector that's pointing out of the paper, but if I do B cross A, right, if I go B and I can't, I can't, uh, and I cross A, I can't really close my hand, right? So I have to, pick my hand up and flip it, close, and then stick my thumb out and go negative. So you'll notice that with the right hand rule, this actually shows that, um, yeah, it's not great. It's not, it's not the perfect thing, but, um, <clears throat> but basically if you look at the screen, if you look at the screen here, A, that's A, that's what I'm laying my hand on. It's a nine year old camera. It's, a, it's sad. If I lay my hand on it just like that, that's what I mean by laying my hand on A. So if you take your hand and put it on the screen, you just match up with A. You can see it. And then, and then, and then you see if you can curl, close your hands towards B. Okay? I also noticed that it's, uh, with the camera, it's going the opposite direction. It really should, but, uh, you know, I can do the mirroring, I guess, but I don't want to. I don't want to figure out with my camera right now. As I said, it's old. Um, so <clears throat> basically, we can actually see the dot product. Normally, I just skip through this and explain it, but because of the way we're looking at it, this this figure here will explain the same thing. So imagine A and B are on the table, okay? Both are products of vectors, but we'd never call the dot product. Uh, we call they're both vector multiplication but they're not both vector products. Uh, the vector product indicates that the output is also a vector, whereas the scalar product or the dot product 
indicates that the output is a scalar. Uh, you know, we just get the uh, context. Um, so, um, so the dot one gives scalar, right? But you, but I want you to, I want to make clear the dot the dot product doesn't just there's not a direction. It's not like you have to find a direction with the dot product. The dot product gets vectors and outputs numbers, and that's it. So magnitudes, yes. The cross product gives a takes vectors and gives vectors. All right. Uh, if you want to look at this mathematically, the um, the uh, let me let me go back here to me. Oh, see, it became one image again. Look at that. Um, if you want, if you the the right way to probably understand this is that um, the the dot product is a mathematical mapping from a vector space to the real number line, and the cross product is a mapping from the vector space to the vector space from R three to R three. Okay, so oh, it's water. <clears throat> um, but here with the right hand rule, <clears throat> um, we have A and B, right? So you'll notice they put their right hand here, they lay it down on A like that, they close it towards B, and they stick their thumb out, and they get C to come up from the table. And you'll notice now with B, they do the same thing. But now they had to pick up their hand so that when they start with B, they can actually close towards A and stick their thumb down, going down from the table. And what this shows you is that, and this is pretty interesting, is that um, um, A cross B is not equal to B cross A, right? <clears throat> and in fact, they negate each other. They, <clears throat> in fact, they negate each other, okay? <clears throat> so, let's see here. Um, so, I have a feeling there's a ton of questions on the right-hand rule. Well, the um, the proof in the could you show us how um, show us how which one the the a oh a cross b equals negative reminds me of matrices it is it, it, it so so yeah it's so the proof in the pudding is really here in the in the slide um, I mean I tried to I can try and show you on the paper uh, let me see if I have a better marker hold on this might be better hold on. All right, let me see here. Is this easier to see than the last one? All right. See, sometimes you just have to, you know, Think past your coughing. So if we can see this, A cross B, I'm going to put my hand on A, just like that. Hold on. Uh, this, you know, this is even on, even in class, this is never perfect. I'm going to put my hand like that on A. Let me see. Let me make, get it here. All right. And I'm going to close it towards B and stick my thumb out. So that gives me A cross B, right? It's just some, some magnitude, which we could calculate, in this out-of-the-screen direction. It's coming towards you, <laughs> in a sense. Now, B cross A, I've got to put my hand on B. It doesn't cross towards A. Notice my hand doesn't close, right? I can stretch it. Ah! So I've got to pick it up, right? And now I can close towards A. But you notice I stick my thumb out now, it's going away from the screen. All right? And so essentially, 1 is not equal to negative 1. We know this. Um, and therefore, because the directions are opposite, we know that um, the negative x hat direction is not the x hat direction. Uh, and because of that, oh, uh oh. 
Hold on. And that because of that, that's where we get the. Uh, that's where we get the. Ne that's why um, a cross b does not equal negative a cross, or a cross b does not equal b cross a. Yes, exactly. The magnitude will be the same, but the signs will be different. <coughs> Yep, no problem. Okay. So I think I want to take a slight break here. We'll come back in about 10, 10 or 12 minutes and get going. Um, we want to cover uh, a bit more of this multiplying vectors business. I want to show you how this works a little bit. Um, I think someone mentioned uh, linear algebra and vectors. This is all linear algebra stuff. Uh, and if you have that artillery, I'd very much suggest that you use it. Um, so <clears throat> um, I, I use I use a matrix determinant to calculate it. I never calculate a cross product this way. Uh, but you can't, and we'll go over how to do it. Um, so let's look at that. And when we come back, um, the figure 319, this one? Yeah. OK, good. It'll be it'll be there for 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 all your viewing purposes and, and pleasures. Um, so I will come back uh, in about um, I'll be back in about ten minutes. Okay. So, but I will still be recording. So keep that in mind as you as you do stuff.
Oh, two screens again. What are we going to do? It'll fix itself. <coughs> All right. So let's give it another minute or so. I'm going to take the attendance, which is just me taking a picture of my phone. So don't worry. All right. Fill that all out by the end of the week. Um, oh, I'll just get my one glass and back to get water, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> It's the 11th uh, edition, but the 11th edition is online only exclusively. It's almost identical to the 10th as far as actual textbook goes. So they're, they're Wiley's decided that their 11th editions and going forward will just be online changes. I should have changed the ISBN on the syllabus, but I guess I forgot because you all have to do the uh, online thing anyway. So, um, yeah. Uh, they, so there is a free version of the textbook. <coughs> you have to you have to pay Wiley Plus, David. You have to do the thing. That's what we do so far. Um, the code is correct, um, but there there is a free version. There's an enhanced book version, which I think is a bunch of bullshit. Um, I think they should give you that when you buy the code, but they don't. Uh, so that's a, a better, more more. Um, uh, navigable version, but there is a version you, with all the content uh, in with the Wiley Plus that you buy. It's just not very portable. That's all. If you have a laptop or a desktop, it's it's okay, but it's not great. But the information is all there. So, um, all right. So let's hop back to it. Um, okay. Uh, sure, although all you have to do is look up the 11th edition of the book. It's, I mean, if you go to Wiley, if you Google it, it should come in. Uh, if you're here, uh, uh, no, I saw you, Artin. I, I, I had you from yesterday, last time. What? The ISBN number isn't illegal. Um, stealing the book is illegal, but the ISBN is just the ISBN number of the book. It's a cataloging tool. <laughs> um, um, no, if you just Google it, it should come up. ISBN. I mean, I'll, I'll try and find it, but it is what it is. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, going back to this. All right, so if you look here, do I have, okay, good. If you look here, you'll notice you have your, uh, they mentioned, they start here with what we mentioned, that the cross product is not commutative, all right? To evaluate the components we distribute, you'll notice that this is a component uh, representation of the cross product, but unlike, but because, remember, uh, where is my pencil? Keep in mind that, that the magnitude of A cross B is 
is equal to a b a sine phi. So keeping this in mind, we're going to notice that only the i cross i parts, right? Only the parallel parts are going to cancel out, and so you'll have six terms, right? i cross i is equal to zero, and you'll you'll notice you'll have i cross j is equal to uh, k hat, right? Because k hat is perpendicular to both. You have to be careful, since it's not commutative, you have to be careful with the order you have here. And I'm going to leave this as an exercise to the student, because it's obnoxious, <coughs> to work out each of these six terms. And then once you work, work out each six of them, you'll notice you have two i hat terms, two j hat terms, and two k hat terms. Now, there is a way, the easy way to figure this out you is to know it is to first it's, it's all memorization at some point right you just have to know these rules and sort of understand them so you have uh, and they're cyclical and what I mean by that is uh, let me show you so you have um, I cross J equals K which is in the example but you'll also have um, J cross K equals i hat, and you'll have k cross i hat equals j hat. You'll notice it always goes i, j, k. i, j, k, i, j, k. It always follows that cycle. And to get the negatives, it's just the opposite ones. So k cross j is negative i hat, j cross i is negative k hat, and so on and so forth. If you've taken some linear algebra, or remember your high school matrices, you can set this up as the, I think they call it the discriminant, um, hold on, no, that's, that's uh, let me get rid of this here, uh, let's delete that, and delete that, okay. Uh, all right, so we want to call this i hat, j hat, k hat, a x, a y, a z, b x, b y, and b z. I'm not going to teach you how to do this, but if you look at this and are like, oh, I know how to take the discriminant uh, or the determinant of this matrix. Go for it. You can do that. That's fine with me. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, don't worry. It's not required, but it is an easier way to do it. If you want to look it up on your own, that's what I encourage you to do. Okay. <coughs> so I think that's it for vectors, but let's make sure. Yeah, uh, Tala. So J cross I would be negative K. Right? So if you look here, right, you have I cross J is K, but remember, B cross A equals minus A cross B. So if you flip them around, you get that minus sign. Okay? Now, I think we have a checkpoint, but I don't want to do that one. And I have, okay. So I have these, um, these problems here, but I, I think this is more useful to do when we actually see it in physics. It's gotten, the day has gotten too abstract. So um, I'm going to leave this up for you to solve uh, if you want to come back to it with the recording, um, basically. Uh, uh, you know, you want to... Uh, um, look at and determine, say, the angle between these two vectors, um, and then calculate this cross product. Uh, give it a chance. If you, I'm going to leave it up here. Hopefully, I've left it up here long enough so that you can uh, come back to this, the recording of the lecture, because we're still recording, and, um, and do it yourself and look at it. And if not, then, you know, let it be. 
Okay, so we want to switch chapters. This is always a bit of a pain. So uh, navigate slides. So we want to go here and uh, it's not giving me a stop sharing. Okay, so let's go to chapter four and see if it loads. If it doesn't, if I get start getting chapter three again, I'm going to be angry. Okay, so we got motion in two dimensions. If I push this and it says vectors, okay, we should be good. So now what we want to do, <coughs> so with chapter four, it's really, it's, it's a bit interesting, really. <coughs> and what I mean by that is I want you to sort of step back for a minute and look at the, the, the course thus far. Uh, the question, like I said, um, you can go back and look at it with the, um, with the recording. I left it on there for like a minute. So just when the movie's loaded, just skip to that part and you'll be able to find it. Um, so, so I want you to think about the class sort of thus far, like where we've come from. And, um, and uh, if you remember before we, we did vectors, we did chapter two, right? With, uh, with one dimensional motion, we had free fall. That was nice, we reviewed that yesterday. Oh, ah, so you can't even catch things sitting down. Um, so now what we want to do is we want to use all that math machinery we spent the last chapter doing and expand chapter two to now be multidimensional. And so you'll notice that we have now motion in two and three. Oh, poop. We have motion in two and three dimensions. All right. And that's what we'll be doing. But I want you to notice how similar everything's going to look to chapter two, but now it's going to have vectors all throughout it. So let's go to um, position and displacement. And we can look here. Let me get back to the chat room so I can see what's going on. Um, and what we can see here is that the position vector, right, <coughs> now, it's not just x, but it's x in the i hat direction plus y in the j hat direction plus z in the k hat direction. And so what we have now is a whole three-dimensional vector right here, right? And an example of a position vector, uh, we can give it we can look at it right here. You'll notice that sometimes vectors are written this way, particularly in math classes. And we usually have this part as the X, Y, and Z. And you'll notice when we uh, uh, translate a random position vector with three coordinates, right, into a unit vector notation, the R vector is equal to negative three I hat plus two J hat plus five K hat. And I want to draw your attention to the graph here. All right. Uh, no, no, it's just that we're not calculating anything. It's just minus three I hat two J. I mean, I'm just reading. I'm not calculating. So yeah, I don't, I don't know where the minus 12. Oh, are you looking for the, uh, the, if you're answering the previous question, like I said, I'll, I'll leave that up to you guys. Um, but here, we're just talking about this, this random vector. <clears throat> and again, you can see here from, it's, and I always hate doing this, I hate doing this even in class, looking at a three-dimension uh, projection on a two-dimension screen, because I, I really, really struggle to do it. <clears throat> a lot of people tell me something looks three-dimensionally, and sometimes it does. But sometimes I'm looking at a bunch of squiggles and people are like, oh, it's a, it's a cube. And I'm like, no, it's a bunch of squares and it's weird. So I struggle to do it. This one is a little okay, but it's still a little weird. Um, so if you look at it and sort of can create the illusion in your mind that you have X, Y, 
and Z. Then you can see you have a little bit of X. That's where that negative 3 comes in. Then the 2, right? And then going back and forth, you have the 5. And that gets you to this R hat area from the uh, origin, all right? Now, when it comes, you might be wondering, how do I break that into magnitude angle? You don't really. Magnitude angle and component going back and forth is really a, a, a something that's limited to the two-dimensional plane. Once we go into three dimensions, it's really, I mean, you can, you can create planes and do components if you like, but you're really going to want to deal with higher dimensions with the uh, component form here, just I hat, J hat, J hat formalism. Um, so, um, and again, we need to pick an origin and a coordinate axis for components to make sense. <coughs> okay. So, going on, again, you're going to notice we're not doing anything different, really. You're going to notice this theme through physics. We learn a few things, and we do learn a few, we get some new sort of mind-blowing things. But a lot of it is expanding on what we already know or combining two things from previous chapters into one new thing. And that's what we see here. We have our, dis we have our displacement vector. In chapter two, right? In chapter two, this, was, th this could be simply written as uh, delta x equals x2 minus x1. And of course, I would write these, I would cross these out and say uh, final and initial. Oh, I'll use the period there for the, not, not the initial. But right, because 2 minus 1 is a little, is a little, um, it's a little sloppy. So let's, let's delete those and be consistent with our class notation. Uh, and, and call this final. Minus initial. Okay. So you'll notice this was just chapter two. Right? Chapter four now, all of a sudden, they're whole vectors. And what that means is, is that instead of just having a final minus an initial, like we have here, right? Final minus initial, we have to write it as a whole vector. So we have the whole final vector minus the whole initial vector, and you'll notice that vectors, when we add, we do it component by component, okay? And so if you look down here with this circle equation, you get the whole delta r, which we, we you know, is, the, is usually what we care about, this, this, this whole displacement vector is equal to delta xi hat plus delta yj hat plus delta zk hat, all right? So, <clears throat> Going forward, <clears throat> let's take a look at what, you know, at, at a problem. And I like this rabbit problem because we'll sort of solve it as we see uh, new and interesting um, new and interesting quantities that before were pretty simple, but now we'll have a vector representation because we're doing them in higher dimensions. So we've got this rabbit, right? It runs across the parking lot. At least someone gets to go outside, right? The rabbit gets to be outside. Uh, on a set of coordinates, which happens to have a set of coordinate axis. Uh, the coordinates of the rabbit's position as functions of time are given by these two functions. Now I want to point, oh, darn it. I want to point out that you'll notice the x and y are independent of each other as far as how the position goes. They're not, they, they're only parameterized by time. Time is the only connecting part. All right? So, <clears throat> It says here, part A, at t equals 15 seconds, what is the rabbit's position vector in unit vector notation and an angle magnitude notation? All right, so we got two things. You'll notice that we're, we're already, it seems like a chapter three question, but now we're applying it to something, okay? So we know, we, um, uh, I would start, since we have x and y explicitly, I'd just start with, the, with, with that. So in order to get the x com component at 15 seconds, we just, uh, here, we, ju we just set t, right, equal to 15 seconds. And we can plug that t into our equation, right? 
and that should give us x. So, and then we can do the same thing. And I'm going to split this one into two. And that should give us y. So use your TI fancy fancies and tell me what you get for x and y in unit vector notation. So what does x equal at 15 seconds? And what does y equal at 15 seconds? All right, we seem to have some class agreement. So I, I'm seeing that x equals 66.25. So I'm going to just write 66.3, yeah, and 57.0 here, right? That's what I'm getting. Okay. All right. Ah, oh, I see a, 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 everyone had minus 57. Okay. That's important. Minus 57. All right. So in that case, R, I guess I'd write this as at, oh, that is not a helpful button. At t equals 15 seconds. That looks more like a six, doesn't it? Let's delete that. At 15 seconds, uh, R. equals, uh, it looks like 66. Three I hat minus 57 J hat. Okay, everyone okay with that? All right, it looks like it. So okay, so we're able to do that position vector. We're gonna wanna keep this in mind. So I almost wish there were a way to sort of highlight this and save it for later and have it go throughout the slides, but that might not be the case. So write this down and we're gonna use this value again, okay? <clears throat> this is the unit vector notation. So that's I hat, oh, hold on, sorry. So that's I hat and J hat, okay? But we're gonna wanna keep this vector for later. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, so now it's gonna ask us to graph the rabbit's uh, path for T equals zero to 25 seconds. So in order to do that, <laughs> this we'll do together, don't worry, I'm just gonna explain how to do it. So for right for so right now you have uh, r at t equals fifteen right so all you have to do to look, so you could do this one of two ways you could either get a computer and do it as many make it as fine as you want uh, or you could pick five points so what I would do is I'd make a uh, I'd make a chart here right where we have uh, t x and y, and I'd go, I'd have t equals zero. I'd probably do it in terms of five, 10, 15 we already have, right? So we'd have this here would be 66 minus 57, uh, 20 and 25. Uh, and you do the same thing that you did. Now, I'm not going to have you do it. I mean, if you want to do it, you can. But um, 
Oh, right, right. We're supposed to do uh, the mag. I, I, good job, Daniel. I for, completely forgot about the uh, magnitude uh, um, portion of it. But yeah, no, good. Good. We're going to need that too. Um, but here for the graph, <coughs> um, we're going to want to get these points out. And this will help us draw the following graph for the, um, the system, which is this graph here. All right. And you can see, so the only thing I would take issue with is the 40 degrees for the angle. Because we know that it's, if, if we look back, we want to remember that um, R is equal to uh, 66, basically. Um, no, hold on. Sixty-six I minus fifty-seven J. What that tells me is that our if we have a coordinate system and I'm positive in X and minus in Y, that I'm in the fourth quadrant. All right? Positive in X, minus in Y, I'm in the fourth quadrant. So you have to be sure, and so an angle of 40.7 would be up here, and that's just not what we have. And you'll notice that at x, x equals 15, we're very consistent there, right? It's, uh, and we can see we're, we're pretty much right. So, <laughs> so you want to be careful with how you get that angle, and be sure to add the appropriate 90 or 180 or whatever it needs <coughs> to be in the right quadrant, okay? So... Looking at this, you'll notice you, 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 at t equals 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, you just draw a line through all these and get a pretty good idea of the shape, okay? The easiest ones to do, of course, would be 15 since we already have it done, and t equals 0. But I want to point out also that this is now an, a y versus x graph. This is not a position versus time graph. So I'm going to point that out for you, you know, the next couple times, but... Always check your axes to give yourself the right context for your graph, okay? Oh, what? Siri? Hold on, I heard a beep. Um, I didn't get that. What's talking? Was that one of you guys? Oh, okay, I think that was one of you. All right, no, I, I think I got confused. That's what's going on here. Uh, there's too many things with speakers that can talk. Um, so, anyway, don't. What? What? What was there a question? I want to be sure I didn't miss a question. If you ask me a question, I thought the phone was talking. And the phone is the devil. <coughs> All right. Okay. I'm. I'm gonna go forth. All right, so it's kind of a neat graph, isn't it? I don't know. I'm looking outside thinking of being the rabbit running around. It doesn't have to worry about the pandemic. Maybe it does, though. It's a cross-species deal. All right, so now as we, as we continue our discussion, it's going to look familiar, right? It really looks familiar. I want to call your attention. We've already defined average velocity but we did it before in one dimension. And I wanna, I wanna show you, you know, again, in chapter two, we had, I wanna see if I can do it with the mouse. Oh no, that's terrible. Uh, in chapter two, right, we had that V average. Hold on, this is all getting annoying. We had V average equals delta X, over delta t, right? But in chapter four, so it was just this part, right? That's the circled part here. <coughs> this is chapter two. This is chapter two, right? You'll just see how it expands. The delta t is the same but um, for both of them. But now we add more to it, and that's all we're doing. And you'll notice that you can break it into these separate, these separate components here, since the delta t scales through each component of the vector. 
and you get this. Uh, they're probably going to write it like this in the next slide, so I'll feel redundant for doing it. But you can write it um, this way as well. You can you can get your um, you can get my pencil, and you can write this as the x, right? You can write this as the y. And I don't have enough room down here, so I'm going to write it up here. You can write this as VZ. Okay? So you're going to get velocity components, and you'll be able to, ex to talk about them as averages. We want to put that into average, average. All right? I'm just, I'm just pointing out here that these are indeed averages. That, that's a poorly written. This is VY average. So there's a there's a, a nice little simple example here. A particle moves through a displacement equal to 12i uh, in the or 12 meters in the i hat direction plus three. <laughs> yes, very good, Artin. It's the sum of it's three average. I mean, sort of, right? It's 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 definitely the three averages, but you can't really sum them because of these components. So it's a, I think it's probably more correct to say it's a vector of averages. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's, that's what it is. <laughs> um, if you were to sum the averages, strictly speaking, once you had them, you just add them all together, but we can't do that. <coughs> uh, so we just want to be careful with our math language and not, we don't, I mean, we want to upset the mathematicians a little bit, but not too much. You know, we want to, we want to keep things clear because everything is does have specific definitions. That's why I, I don't mean to sound um, nitpicky with it, but if I do sound a little nitpicky, it's just it's just so you don't get confused later on doing an operation right that's different than what you would be doing. Um, so <coughs> so what we can do then is we can plug this. Um, this displacement vector into the delta r term, right? And you'll notice it just gets plunked right here. It's the same, the same uh, vector. And we can plug in the delta t given in the example right into the delta t term, 2.0 seconds. Uh, here, you've got to ask yourself, can I combine these? This is in the i hat direction. This is in the k hat direction. Even though there is a sum here, a plus sign, these two terms cannot be combined. However, they can each be divided by delta t. So 12 divided by 2 is 6, right? So you get 6 meters per second in the i hat direction. And 3 divided by 2 is 1.5 meters per second in the k hat direction. OK? So <coughs> So oh, sorry about that. <sighs> I've been sitting for way too long. <laughs> and that's saying something for someone who likes to sit as much as I do, believe me. Uh, so with that being said, that's our simple example. Now, for the instantaneous velocity, all we have to do is look at, let's, let's write the average velocity expression again. Uh, our average, or no, bleh. And delete that. All we have to write is that um, ba, 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 is that v average equals delta r over delta t, right? So with this being the case, <coughs> excuse me. With this being the case. Get back to the selector or the pointer. Um, all we have to do is the same thing we did in chapter two. Again, you just shrink the delta t interval down to zero, and you have your definition of a derivative again. And I would remind you, and I won't do it often, but if you have um, a function, uh, da, 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 da. If you have some great big function, let's call it f of t equals g of t 
plus h of t, right? I would remind you that calculus, when you do, when you do uh, take a derivative, an integral, or a limit on, on the whole function, you can take it on in each individual part, all right? So in a sense, this makes, you know, taking the limit of delta t in one component will do it for the others, and you very nicely get um, the highlighted equation here which is that the instantaneous velocity will be the time derivative of the vector r with respect to t. And all you have to do is take that in component by component, okay? Um, oh, I can't breathe through my nose. Hold on, I'm gonna, this will, uh, I just need one second here. And I'm sure that all, oh, right, that's why that's working. I'm sure none of you wants to see me blow my nose. <clears throat> Hold on. Or hear it. I'll be back in just one in exactly ten seconds. All right, that was a little gross, but it's over now. So, oh no, well, share video. Guys, uh, the velocity vector, um, again, Slope of the tangent line really does work. It's a little harder to picture in multiple dimensions with multiple things going along. But if you break it down dimension by dimension, uh, it'll work. Okay. All right. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. All right. So you'll notice that this is just, uh, all this is, is merely you know, saying what we've already said before. Uh, if you take the time derivative of r on the other side to get this velocity vector, that dt goes through each component. And then, remember we wrote this before, so you get v equals, we just did it with averages, but now we have v equals vx plus vy in the j hat plus vz in the k hat. And you'll notice you can look at all these components and sort of, it's sort of basically a chapter four problem at its worst can be expressed as um, three chapter three problems. Okay, so. Uh, you cannot see my trash trash bucket off screen, but it's, it's there and it's helpful. Um, okay, so. Now, this is interesting, right? Let's take a look at this down here. We want to note that a velocity vector does not extend from one point to another. It only shows direction and magnitude. <coughs> okay, so that means when we're visualizing it, if we go back, you'll notice the velocity vectors, the position vectors all start at our origin and are very nice. The velocity vectors, though, only show us the direction and magnitude at which it's changing direction. It doesn't start at the origin. Okay, that's what that little part's saying right there, or to, to make it make it clear. Uh, so let's do this checkpoint. We've got circles. So, all right. So this figure here shows a circle, uh, and uh, we can see here. Um, I, I prematurely went to the pencil. 
<coughs> so if the instantaneous velocity of the particle is given by the velocity vector here, through which quadrant is the particle moving at that point if it's traveling counterclockwise and be clockwise around the circle? So for both cases, draw on the figure. So let's take a look here. So first of all, we have to define clockwise and counterclockwise, right? So if I'm going to be moving clockwise, I move like a clock, right? Notice my hand is moving like a clock hand around. Um, and this is usually associated with negative rotation or angular negative angular motion. And counterclockwise, you'll notice we start moving through quadrant one. And counterclockwise, we usually call positive motion, OK? So we'll notice that we're interested in a point at which the x and y components are at least the same. So if we're moving around at this velocity, and first it wants us to do clockwise, so here, let's do the pencil. Let me ask you. So at, at any point here, Uh, any point here as I move along the circle, is my velocity, am I moving in the positive or negative x direction? Positive. Ne good. Negative only, right? Negative is going, I'm decreasing my x. So if I, so as I do that, we'd expect my dx dt to be, uh, negative and it's not right v is positive here in the i direction so i don't think we'd be in this fourth quadrant if we're moving clockwise now what about the third quadrant is my um is it possible for me to be pointing here i would expect my velocity vector to be pointing in a increasing x direction or a negative again right no, we want to be in a place where I is increasing, say, our second quadrant, but J is decreasing, right? So if we're going to a place where we're increasing, where we're, where we're pointing um, uh, from, uh, with, if V is going to be 2I minus 2J, we might want to, yeah, we want to be somewhere where we're going here, and as we move around, our velocity vector would be, if we look at this velocity vector right here, so when I look at this, the x component is, the x component here is getting smaller, right? And the y component, as I move through here, at this point is in the uh, positive direction. So it doesn't look like it's quadrant two. Right, I don't have, I don't have the, we're, yeah, this is going to be one of those hard ones. We're just, I'm, I'm pointing at the arrow now, the blue arrow that's written. So I'm going to make another color arrow so that I can differentiate between them. You can see them. Oh, no, that didn't work. So if you look at the yellow arrow now, let's look at these vectors. Because remember, we have to be tangent. So da, 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 we use purple. So basically, we're moving we're moving uh, clockwise, right? Well, you need the well, you, you don't need it so much increasing and decreasing. You need the x to be positive and the y to be negative, right? So and we, and it needs to be described by this tangent vector. So if I look at that. If I look at that, right, I got to ask myself which one is going to be uh, in which in which case does this um, does this apply? So take a look at the vectors now and see where when you look at the when you look at it, <coughs> right? <coughs> where 
where things match up. So I want to point out that, so let's see, you said quadrant four, right, Dan? So let's look at quadrant four. So quadrant four, I thought we already eliminated that one. In quadrant four, I have x, I have, I look like my, my vector in x looks negative, where here, because this is the velocity vector, right? Whereas here it should be positive. So I need, I need to be going, I need to be pointing in that, you know, hold on, let me get the pointer now. I need to be pointing right in the positive x direction. You'll notice that the horizontal component of this vector, uh, yeah, Tala. Oh, you meant the, oh, okay, all right. Um, so I'll just finish what I was saying though, because I, you know, someone else might be confused. Uh, Daniel changed his, his answer. So in the fourth quadrant, we see um, it's not so much, it's not that x is decreasing, right? As we move, it's certainly decreasing, but it's that it points in a negative direction in quadrant four, right? If you break this up into negative and positive or into components, right, wherever you are here in this quadrant, the, um, the x-axis or the x-vector will be pointing in this negative direction, the horizontal component. Let me do it with the pencil really quick. And what I mean by that is let me draw this triangle like this, okay? You'll notice for this vector, right, we're down. And again, the hard part here, and I wanna point this out, uh, I wanna go back to what that slide said without actually going back because I don't wanna lose what we read, but note a, velo a velocity vector does not extend from one point to another. It only shows direction and magnitude. So we can't think of the position behavior in terms of the velocity behavior, right? It doesn't show us the same things. All we can do is look at these individual <coughs> these individual velocity vectors, right? And we're moving, cl we're moving clockwise in all of them, all right? No, we're moving clockwise through the whole thing. Everything points to the same thing. We've not considered counterclockwise yet. I wanna make that very clear, all right? Notice how I'm going, I'm always following the arrow. Look at that as I traverse the circle clockwise, okay? Each of these arrows is clockwise. What I did here is I broke up the uh, uh, vector into x and y components in red here. These are not arrows. Okay? All of them are clockwise. Yes. Uh, and so we can see that the, the component here for the velocity vector is negative, right? It points in the negative x direction and it points in the y direction. Now you might be, or, and, and here you'll also notice we're going negative y, negative x. And you might be saying to yourself, well, wait a minute, isn't that the third quadrant that's negative, negative? You would be correct. We're not talking about position vectors anymore. We're talking about velocity vectors. Once we make the transform, we can only look at the vector and get its magnitude and direction. It's not from point to point anymore. That's a property of the displacement vector. Okay, that's, that's the real key here. All the arrows are, are uh, clockwise at this point. We are not doing counterclockwise yet. We are only doing part A. So if we look at each of these vectors, we wanna look at the one that points in the positive x direction, all right? And the negative, or that at least is positive in the x direction. So you'll notice that this points in the negative x direction, this one points in the negative x direction. So therefore we can eliminate, right? Hold on, we can eliminate these two arrows. Does everyone see that? Because I'm gonna delete them. This has a negative has a negative x direction, so that's gone, and so does this one. So our answer can't be those quadrants. Now, now that we have our, now that we're down to our negative x components, we're gonna look, this one is pointing in the positive y direction. Hold on, sorry. I know, cursor. We have this one pointing in the positive y direction. That's not gonna help us. So we can get rid of that one. And this one looks like it fits the bill, yeah? So let's, um, 
let's get rid of the incorrect arrow. And all we're left with is our our correct answer. Does everyone understand why the yellow one is correct, though? That's the important part. So the the yellow the, so the yellow arrow is in the first quadrant, yes. Um, and the red arrow, I don't remember where it was. Uh, if I think the red arrow was here. That would have been the third quadrant. Sure. So you'll notice we go down in Y and positive in X, right? So from our tail, we have to go down. Hold on, let me go back to the, we go down. That gives us our negative J hat component. And we go positive in the X direction. That gives us our positive component here. All right, and then very good. We're gonna see that B, if we're moving counterclockwise, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go away, I don't wanna get to B yet. That answer is correct for B, but I want to be sure <laughs> you see what we're talking about with A first. All right, so I want to be sure. I think I got uh, Zilla's question, and I want to read Mina's question. Isn't the X positive increasing? Negative D, since V is positive, only the first Q quadrant fits the bill. That's right, yeah, yeah. So again, and that's a good way of putting it. In the first quadrant, this vector, remember it's the, uh, um, it's the tangent line, that's the velocity at this point going around in the circular motion. Uh, at this point, the velocity vector is pointing in a positive x direction and a negative y direction. Yeah. So it's quadrant one. Okay? So I want you to convince yourself for the answer for, I, wanted, I want to look at B and uh, I'm going to clear everything. So with B, now we're going to go counterclockwise, right? And I want to at least show you, so counterclockwise would be like this. So let's see why quadrant, before we see why quadrant three is the answer, let's see why quadrant one is no longer the answer first. So let me get that. So now if I'm going counterclockwise, I'm pointing, oh dear, hold on. I'll draw, I'll just do a line so that I don't get that. Right, so now we're going this way. Um, and you can see the vector now has a positive Y component and a negative X component. We've switched it, right, because we flipped directions. So the minuses become positive and the positive become minuses. Um, <clears throat> so you'll notice that this is no longer this is no longer the solution, but using symmetry, we can see that once we get down to here, right? Let me draw the, the vector in quadrant three. Right? Once we get down here going counterclockwise, we can see this has an increasing increasing x value and a decreasing y value. Okay, and that's what we need. So that's where quadrant three becomes the um, the same. All right, so are we good? And we'll see we'll see it in much more um, we'll see it in uh, in much uh, as I say prettier fashion because we'll look at the um, you know. I don't, I don't, I don't quite have the ability to draw this nicely, <laughs> um, but you can see the nice, the nice, uh, the nice solution there. I'll leave it up for a little bit. Okay, so I think that is a good place to uh, probably stop. Let me see what we're doing next. Oh, you know what? I've got four minutes, and this is this is actually a better place to stop. So. Uh, because we, I want to re, re, recall this problem uh, tomorrow. So, uh, so don't run away yet. <laughs> um, 
So for the rabbit in the preceding sample problem, it says find the velocity at a time equals t equals 15 seconds. So what we have to do there, right, is we want to recall. Ah, okay. So this is good dimension. So Tuesday, I'm not having six hours of lecture all the time every week. So Tuesday is your lab day. For your lab day, um, lab is going to work. Uh, again, it's, it's mostly independent work. I'm there to, like, fix equipment and stuff. Since the equipment is all going to be online, I'm just going to have things posted for you to do, and you should work on them. Uh, so your lab and lab instructions will be posted there. I will be available probably at 2 um, on my Skype. Uh, uh, again, I might I might start a session, just a question session for each of the labs for like a, for for like an hour or so. Uh, I haven't I haven't worked that out yet. Um, but you should work on it on your own, and it, you're you're gonna find it should be pretty straightforward, especially without the equipment and the equipment breaking. Things are gonna be a lot easier to like do. So uh, it, it's if you have questions or office hours, we can it, office hours will be a better place to to do that. I think. So you should probably just want to reach me on Skype and ask an individual question because that's what I would do in lab, right? I'd go around and individually work with people. Um, so um, there should be an instruction set on the recorded sessions. If you go to, uh, if you click on um, on the pointer, you, you should have all these options. If you click on the three lines, um, yes, you do have to make a lab report. You'll, but we're not going to have as many as we would have uh, I'm going to combine some units together. Uh, so, like, for instance, we can do a lot more with forces with the simulations than we would have in lab. So I'm going to create, basically, it's going to be, um, uh, uh, you know, you're going to do the free fall lab. That'll have its own lab report. I have data for that. I'm going to post that soon, and you're going to follow the instructions like you took the data. You might have to do some more analysis on your own, but that's fine. That's good for your soul. Um, and then we're going to go into, uh, for, we're going to have a vectors activity which you'll write up, so we'll have sort of our first three activities. And then we're going to do a set of force labs, a set of conservation labs, and then uh, our final set of labs, we'll do, we'll do a, a combine those two into a final lab report. Uh, and that'll, that'll probably be, be what we do. There will be a lot to do for those activities, though, so don't take it too lightly. Uh, but it's, it's just as far as what you're turning in. Basically, we're just going to do these first three activities with a short form report. Um, and then I'll grade those over spring break, get them back to you, and then um, and then we'll do our long form reports. Um, and it's just going to be a little different. So it'll it'll make. I still have to work out some of the details, but it'll make sense. But no, we won't be meeting like this on Thursday or on Tuesday. Rather, we will on Thursday. So, but this is but your lecture days are Thursday and Friday. Uh, so that's what we'll be doing. Um, and like I said, we will have to make lab. You will have to make lab report. Um, you can extend the lab. Oh, yeah, no, the labs, yeah, we're, we're, I'm, don't worry about the lab report. Just get it done when you can get it done. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going crazy on that. Um, yeah, no, no, I, I'll be available online on Tuesday, but no online class on Tuesday, yes. Um, so, <clears throat> um, again, you'll have the lab instructions. I suggest you use that time to work on the lab as if you were there, uh, and then uh, ask me questions. Uh, on Skype. Yes, everything will be submittable on Blackboard. Um, let me get through. Let me get through this though. This this one example. I just want to sort of show you where to start. So we want to go um, sort of back to the beginning with the rabbit. And if we're going to find its velocity at 15 seconds, right? The first thing we have to do is take these derivatives. So when we do that, we want to find uh, Vx will be equal to uh, the derivative of the first term will be minus 0.62t plus 7.0, right? And then here, we'll have 0.44t minus 9.1. All right, so now we have our two equations from which to plug time into, and I'll let you do that, and we'll have a velocity vector at that point uh, when we start next time.
Okay, so that's what I wanted to do. Uh, the recordings. Um, if if you look on um, if you look on YouTube, it's because it, it's kind of hard to describe without having my my pointer disappears. Uh, if you look where my pointer is now, right, and you go up to the see the three bars. It, there should be a show recordings option, like once we're out of the room, like we're in the room now, you can't access the recordings, but there should be a out of the room. I think what I might do is, um, <clears throat> what I might do is I'll, I think I'm going to post some instructions on Blackboard and share my screen. I can't really do it now when we're in session. And if I stop the session to do it, we'll lose this recording. So it's very important that we don't lose this recording. Um, so uh, later tonight, I'll probably make those instructions and put them on so you can find them, okay? And I'll just put them as an object in Blackboard in Section A. So it's no big deal. Um, no problem. So, um, so, okay. So I think you're welcome. So I think uh, that's it for today. Just try and plug that 15 seconds in here and get those velocity. Oh, I, I should have written here because I'm, you know, Vy. Don't forget that part uh, equals right. We don't want to don't want to be too sloppy. Although that's that's kind of sloppy. Um, and yeah, that should that should do it. So um, I will the ne our next online session will be next Thursday. I will be available and online uh, on my Skype account. Uh, if you have questions about the lab, I will be posting that this weekend. Lab two. Okay. Um, so, and I'm sure, I'm sure we'll have a lot of uh, questions about it. So anyway, yes, uh, Tala. Uh, so is R from negative 2.1 and negative 2.5? Is what? Negative 2.1 and negative 2.5. Oh, for the velocity? That sounds right. Um, I haven't looked at it yet. I'd say, uh, um, oh, so I did the Skype last time, but I can always do it. Uh, my Skype, I leave on, and it's uh, it's just my work email on the syllabus, so I'm about to do it now. Uh, if you just search uh, at lagcc.cuny.edu, um, if you look for that, uh, you should find me. Um, and uh, yeah, so so Skype is better for one-on-one -on -one stuff, and we can we can do that. Um, you're you're all free to go. <laughs> um, so all right, farewell. I'm I'm gonna stop the recording now.